moment and pray with me, please. Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing unto you. Fill my lungs with your breath, my mouth with your message. Let all that I say and all that I do, Lord, bring honor to you and to you alone. I ask all things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. There was a sign we went to a um, one of the little towns throughout Gatlinburg, and the whole community is a craft community. So they had all kinds of homemade, wonderful stuff. Um, but there was a sign on the window, and it said, with freedom comes responsibility. And I thought, oh, that's a pretty good segue into, I wanted to talk about responsibility today. I said, I know that saying from somewhere. Does anybody remember who originally said that? Eleanor Roosevelt, and her quote was, freedom makes a huge requirement of every human being. With freedom comes responsibility. Responsibility means being accountable, right? Being accountable for what you say, being accountable for what you do, being accountable for what you don't do, being accountable for what you don't say. But you know, a, a many, many studies over the last 40 years or more say that we tend to look at ourselves in a large degree and we act in the same way to other people's perception of us. Do we base our self-worth, our self-esteem on what other people say to us and about us. You see, if we see ourselves as losers, we're gonna act and talk like a loser. If we see ourselves as successful, we're gonna act and talk and walk like we're successful. If we see ourselves as a victim, we're going to act like a victim. If we see ourselves as uncreative, we're never going to try to be creative. If we see ourselves as a piece of junk, that's the way we will treat ourselves. And worse yet, that's the way we will talk to ourselves. And many studies say our beliefs really do determine our behavior. Beliefs that we have tend to originate back from our childhood and we, we carry those negatives with us. And unfortunately, many of those things that we believe that we were told when we were young, they're wrong. They're just not true. And many people have a negative view of themselves simply because of inaccurate or incorrect information that they have received from misinformed and unauthorized sources in their lives. We need to look at ourselves from a different perspective. We need to hear from an informed and an authorized source on who we really are. Consider this story. A student in architecture entered a nationwide contest for building design. Judged by a panel of architects, her design received an honorable mention. She was very depressed. She believed hers was the best design that was there. At lunch on the last day of the convention, she was sitting and eating her sandwich, looking at her creation and still believing it was really good. And this old man stood there and he looked at it too. And at last he remarked, not knowing who had designed the building, this one, I think, he says, is the best of them all. Judges had merely given her the honorable mention, but this one man really liked it. She was, this young student was very elated. And why was that opinion so important? It's because the old man was Frank Lloyd Wright, the greatest architecture of the time. You see, we put too much faith in other people's opinions. We put too much faith in what they think of us. And I call them the unauthorized source of who I am. We need to look at God's definition of who we are. God, as the authorized source, is who we need to follow. And you know, it, it's interesting how much we worry about what other people think, right? 
we were away in Tennessee, and my sister-in-law, as many of you have prayed to, and I'm so thankful for that, um, but she has to wear this mechanical thing to make her heart beat. So she's always got to be plugged into an outlet or carry a 15-pound battery pack just so her heart will beat. But this, it was either that or not. So they were her choices. But we would get dressed to go out because with the battery pack on, she could be out for a few hours at a time. And she had her Uggs on because she's always cold. Believe me, it was not cold there. It was warm. But she had her Uggs on. I had my shorts and flip-flops on it. But she would say, oh, the Uggs don't look right. I should put nicer shoes on. I'm like, you're lucky to be alive. Who cares what shoes you have on your feet? But how many of us, right, before we go out, what will someone else think of my shoes? What will someone else think of the outfit I put on today? We need to go back to who God created us to be and who God knows us to be. So that's the reason I went back to the beginning, back to Genesis, verse 12. When God calls Abram and tells him to leave his country, he had to leave his people, he had to leave his father's household and just go to this unknown place. And God tells him, not only will he find, be found a great nation, but other nations on the earth will be blessed through Abraham's descendants. Through Abraham's family tree, Jesus Christ was born to save us, to save all of humanity. Through Christ, we have a personal relationship with God. So there is the first reason of why we are blessed. How do we know we're blessed? Because it says it right from the beginning in Genesis. When God called Abram, he called him from a godless, self-centered city of Ur to the fertile region of Canaan, where a God-centered, moral nation could be established. Abram built an altar to the Lord in each town that he went into. Altars were made in, in many religions, but for God's people, altars were more than a place of sacrifice. For them, altars symbolized communion, communion with God and commemorated notable um, encounters with him. Many altars remained in place for years as continual reminders of God's protection and God's promises. Abram built his altars for two reasons. Anybody want to take a guess? Why would he build altars in every town he went? One, for worship and prayer. So he had a place to go and worship and pray. And two, as a reminder of God's promises to him. You know, we, we tend to forget things, right? We need reminders. Abram couldn't survive spiritual, spiritually without regularly renewing his love and loyalty to God. Building altars helped Abram remember that God was at the center of his life. And we have this. We have this safe place where we can come and worship every single week together to remember what God desires from us, to remember um, that we are to be motivated to obey him, to remember how blessed we are by God. No matter what others say about us, our main focus needs to be keeping God as the center of our life. And let's look at what Paul says about who we are in Christ Jesus. And Paul says, so in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, neither male or female, you're all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to his promise. Don't let anybody tell you you're anything different. That's who you are. And believe me, his opinion matters a whole lot more than your next door neighbors. Truly it does. Paul was saying that, you know, we've been baptized and we're growing spiritually. And these people were too at the time. And they were ready to take on the privileges and the responsibilities of being chosen people. 
And I know I've said this before, but remember back in those days, Jewish men, and they would often start their day with this crazy prayer of, Lord, I thank you that I am not a Gentile, a slave, or a woman. Seriously. But the role of women was totally enriched by Christianity. Faith in Christ transcends these differences and makes all believers one in Christ. Not just us here in this little safe community, but all throughout the world. We are one in Christ. We are believers and we are heirs. The original promise to Abraham was intended for the whole world, not just his physical descendants. All believers participate in this promise and are blessed as children of Abraham. And in our third reading today from Peter, Peter says, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Don't let anybody tell you you're anything less than that. You are blessed and you are chosen. Christians sometimes speak about this priesthood of all believers. Well, in the Old Testament, people did not approach God directly. A priest acted as their intermediary, right? They had to go to their priest. If they wanted to say a prayer, they had to go to the priest to ask for the prayer so the priest could go to God to ask for the prayer. We don't have to do that anymore because of Jesus Christ. We can go directly to him. Too many times people base their con self-concept perhaps on their accomplishments. But our relationship with Christ is far more important than what job you hold, what successes you've had, whether how wealthy you are or how smart you are. We have been chosen by God as his very own and we have been called to represent him to others. Think about your week this past week. When did you act like a representative of God? To whom did you act like the hands and feet of Jesus Christ? To whom did you walk by and not give a second thought about? Did you not give a second thought about those affected by the hurricane? You know, we spent a lot of time, as Nicole said, they were in the DR, we're watching it. We were watching it because my brother lives in Florida. <laughs> So he was waiting to see what happened to his house. Do we care about those people and what happened to them, or do we just go about our business? We are called to be representatives of God, and that's an every day, all day, 365 days a year responsibility. We are called to, set, to be set apart from this world, and we've been given a very distinctive purpose. We are to serve and worship God and imitate Christ in every single aspect of our life. As followers of Jesus, we must embrace our own identity with Christ that Christ bestowed upon us, which is to live a holy life, empowered by God's grace, and, and feel the presence of the Holy Spirit. Abilities. What is our responsibility as people who have been chosen by God? Well, Peter in chapter 2, verse 1, tells us that we have to rid ourselves of all malice, all deceit, all hypocrisy, all envy, and all slander of every kind. That's a whole lot of instruction in one short sentence. Rid yourselves of malice means the um, intention to do evil. A person shows malice when they intentionally commit a crime. So boy, if we could get everyone to not uh, have malice, to not have an intent to commit a crime, just think of the world we could live in. Get rid of all deceit. Deceit is the behavior that is deliberately intended to make people believe something that's not true. 
Same thing as lying, fraud, or cheating. And again, if we could do away with those things, it's a job, it's a responsibility, it takes work, it's effort. It's not easy being a Christian, but it is a privilege to be a Christian. We are to get rid of all hypocrisy. We are to stop trying to pretend who we are not. Jesus condemns all hypocrites. The word hypocrite comes from the Greek word that means play actor. Don't be a hypocrite. We should not envy. Envy is a big one. Envy is the painful feeling of wanting what somebody else has, like their attributes or their possessions. If you're jealous and feel threatened or protective or fearful of losing one's position to someone else, we shouldn't envy. If somebody has more than you, that's, that's their blessing from God. That's not your problem. Leave it alone. Focus on you. Focus on the gifts God has given you and how can you use them. This, this cook in Atlantic City is using his um, gift of being a chef to cook 2,500 meals. Mm -hmm. Our gift here is we can give financially. We can make the buckets. They are our gifts. We don't need to worry about what that person's gift is. Worry about what your gift is. And slander, the act or crime of making false spoken statement. Stop talking about other people. Right? That's the bottom line. Again, worry about yourself. Don't worry about what other people think and what they say. You need to take care of you. That says a lot about what we should not be doing as chosen people who are blessed by God. But what should we be doing? In life, there are two teams the way I see it. You can be Team Christ or Team World. You can't be both. People normally want to be chosen by others who they think are cool. The honest truth is that many Christians are envious of Team World because Christians have forgotten how it feels to be chosen. Our responsibility of being chosen is that we have to live an all-in life for Christ as being chosen by God's grace. You need to be determined, not half-hearted, in your relationship with him. Obeying God. Deuteronomy 7, verses 11 and 12. <clears throat> so keep the command and the rules and regulations that I command you today. Do them. And this is what will happen. When you, on your part, will obey these directives, keeping and following them, God, on his part, will keep the covenant of loyal love that he made with your ancestors. He will love you, he will bless you, and he will increase you. I think that says a lot. We have a responsibility to build up God's community. We need to be living for God's approval. Think back now with me to a time when you were probably in your teenage years that you were sneaking around doing something that you didn't want mom and dad to know you were doing. Anybody? Am I the only one? I don't think so. All right, we all didn't want mom or dad to find out we were doing something, right? Well, guess what? You can't hide it from God. He knows what you're doing and he sees what you're doing. And as I was writing that, the, well, last week before I went away, my first thought was, Man, am I glad my parents didn't have that power. <laughs> Just think if they did. I'd have been punished a whole lot more often, I think. We need to be intentional. We need to do things with our whole heart. We need, as Pastor Nicole said, we need to maybe hurt a little bit or do without a little bit. What if you gave up one coffee run to a takeout place a week and gave that money to help others? We need to pray. I don't think we spend enough time in communication with God. Just think if you only talk to your spouse as often as you talk to God, how close would that relationship be? And we need to choose God. We need to make sure that God prevails in our life above everything else. We need to desire God's word. We need to long to know what it says. We can't follow what we don't know. 
We need to seek God's kingdom and righteousness. We need to evangelize. People, when they see us and the way we act and the way we treat other people, they'll know there's something special about you. You're not self-centered and self-focused. And why is that? It's because we're living for God. We're not living just to please ourselves. So when you're courteous or kind or helpful to some stranger, you're showing God's love. And that's a big part of our responsibility. We need to know what is written in the Bible and follow the way he calls us to live. We need to live by the commandments and intentionally be an example of what a Christ follower should be. Being an adult today is not easy. It has a lot of challenges, we know. But God qualifies us through our shortcomings the same way he qualified Moses when he called him upon him to lead the Israelites and to stand up to Pharaoh. Whatever desire God puts in your heart, not your own worldly desires, but whatever desire God puts on your heart, he will qualify you to do. You have to trust and believe. 1 Peter 2, 9 <clears throat> says that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Declare means to advertise, to proclaim. The incredible blessings that Christians have inherited in Christ are not only to be received with gratitude, but it's to motivate us to testify to the goodness of Jesus Christ. And lastly, if we follow Matthew 27, 30, 22, 37 to 39, Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. Now, did Jesus make up these words? Where did they come from? They came from the Old Testament. Deuteronomy 6, 5. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. They came from Leviticus 19, verse 18. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Jesus was reminding them of what they would have already memorized, what they already knew. You know you are chosen by God. You know you are blessed by him. My responsibility today is to remind you of that, to get you to remember that on a daily basis. And if we were to follow these greatest commandments, then all the other responsibilities that I've mentioned would be very easy. But we, we humans, we like to make life difficult, don't we? As a believer, you know, again, that you are chosen. You are set apart to belong to God, not the team world, but team God. And as such, you should be living your life all in for him. Live for his approval. As much as you always wanted your parents' approval, we need to want our Heavenly Father's approval on the words we use, the actions we take, the way we conduct ourselves, and the way that we just do all of our living. We need to live for the main purpose of honoring God. This being chosen, this being chosen is not easy. This is, this is a tough job we have. It's a big responsibility. As much as we never wanted to disapprove or to disappoint or lose the approval of our earthly parents, we have to absolutely, with everything we think and say, think, is that approved by God? Or am I doing it for selfish behaviors? Take this responsibility seriously. Jesus hung on that cross. He was tortured. He was tormented. And he died on that cross so that he could come back just so that we could have the privilege and the responsibility of being a Christian. Amen? Amen. 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 Take a moment and pray the Lord's Prayer with me at this time. Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation. 